After the one o'clock news, uh, Night Rides, the programme, Patrick Lance, your host. But now it's a funny business. Mike Craig interviewed tonight's guest, Peter Kavanagh, at his home in Chipping Norton in 1977, when he needed no encouragement to reminisce about the great days of the wireless. It's a funny business remembers the voice of them all, Peter Kavanagh. John Betjamin. What a dear man. Lovely character. And I was on his uh, TV programme, Meet John Betjeman. And uh, the producer said uh, at the end of the programme, just do a little impression of John Betjeman, you know, in front of him for him to hear. So I described this mental picture very, very quickly of this fork in the road with an island on it and this Victorian edifice, being polite, I'll call it an edifice, rusty old iron railings, bits of chick green paint falling off, door half hanging off, there it stands in all its Victorian rotting glory, this public edifice, except for the brass box, which says, insert penny here. You're with me now? <laughs> and uh, this had been lovingly burnished and polished and polished and burnished by the attendant for years until the words place penny in here had almost disappeared except for about two halves of a letter you see and then as sir john betjeman i said green painted doors now somewhat plainer pennies in a burnished brass container like golden suns go tinkling down upon the loos of Camden Town <laughs> and he loved it at the height of his career Peter Kavanagh was undeniably the best impressionist around a lot of people myself included still rate him as the best ever Peter died in 1981 and you know, no theatrical bill matter ever described an act with more accuracy. The voice of them all. He really was. And I think I ought to mention that in this programme, every single voice you hear was done by Peter, sitting in his favourite armchair at his home in Chipping Norton. So enjoy again with me the talent of this lovely man, as It's a Funny Business remembers Peter Kavanagh. Mike, everybody seems to think, when they're having a chat at home, like we are now, that I was an impersonator, uh, child prodigy like Mozart or was on the piano, you know. Yeah. No such thing at all. Actually, uh, I started off as a straight singer. Really? I was a bass baritone singer. And I took my gold medal at Guildhall School of Music and um, things were jogging along just as a very young man, just coming up to the war. And bang, off we went, and uh, we all went in the services. And I found myself attached temporarily to the core orchestra. And the bandmaster, military bandmaster, said to me, he said, look, I've got a jolly good tenor singer. Could you do the odd joke in the comparing, you yeah, see? Yeah. And I said, well, I don't know. I said, I'll tell you what I did do. I did a couple of impressions. Uh, at home and made people laugh you know, a little while ago and he said oh what were they and I said well uh, Harry Hemsley's little kiddies Winnie and Johnny ha <laughs> ha Mike you're laughing yes, yes I have he's a laughing of that. you're right they were gorgeous weren't wonderful. they wonderful he had Winnie Johnny and Horace yes. you remember and yes, uh, yes. they used to have their conversations Horace could never be understood and Winnie had to translate mm. you know I went to watch Harry Hemsley do this imaginary family on the stage at a music hall. I think it was Nottingham Empire. And I thought, how the heck does a bloke... I mean, radio, fine. You see, you can chat away to the kids and you hear them there and you imagine little Winnie and Johnny and Horace all around there, you see. When you get to the stage, and it's been a, a bill on, you know, with dancing girls and so forth, and on comes Harry Hemsley. How on earth does he put this family over? And he was very, very clever. He sat in an armchair and he held a large daily paper up in front of his face. See? Brilliant. Did the voices behind it? And of course, you imagined the children there. It was absolutely marvellous. Winnie. Yes, Daddy. Winnie, where have you been? We've been for a walk, Daddy. Yes, we've been for a walk to the other way. Yes, I know, Johnny. Wait a minute. Winnie, you were saying. And we saw a mummy piggy. I see. Were the little piggies with her? Piglets. Oh, all right. I stand corrected. Piglets. 
And what were all the piglets doing with the mummy pig? You know what they were doing? <laughs> Rabbits were back, they were all cold, and they were sitting out of food, they were all What does Horace say? He says, yes. I see. Now go on. Well, there was a mummy pig in all the little piglets, and do you know what they were doing, Daddy? No, I don't know what were they doing. They were biting all the buttons off her waistcoat. <laughs> Oh, it was a fantastic little sort of silly routine. And you really imagine the kids in it. Uh, talking of um, forces days, of course, the one that I looked like, the first person I ever looked like for a visual impersonation was, uh, of course, Monty, Field Marshal Montgomery. Yes. Very much younger version, of course, but put the hat on with, the, you know, the two badges, the belly with the two badges and so forth, and, and, and I was away. And he was actually one of the very first uh, that I was able to do... And, of course, everybody knew his voice in the forces, you see. And, um, it you're, well, well, it went down well with him eventually, <laughs> funny enough. Did you meet yes. him? Oh, yes, many times. But um, at the uh, reunion, a Al- 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 reunion at the Albert Hall, where the Queen Mum uh, was usually with Monty, and we did a cabaret, but uh, the, the Queen Mum told me afterwards that he said, Well, now, Your Majesty, if you watch very closely, he does resemble me. And if I know anything about it, he's going to do me. And you did. <laughs> you had the most extraordinary laugh, you know. Over everything. Very piercing. Still, it was a very good playground voice, you know. And then, <laughs> that was Monty. Well, so many people were in uniform. I remember my first broadcast on Variety Bandbox. Private Harry Seacombe arrived in great big boots and covered in confusion and giggles. Dear old Harry. Um, Frankie Howard. Yes, Francis. Oh, yes. <laughs> Oh, the army, you know, yes, poor soul. So we won't could go on, but um, and that was the first broadcast we three did together, myself, Frankie Howard and Harry Seacombe. Of course, Mike, a lot of people also think, we talk about what they think about, and you started very ill and so forth, that uh, I started doing just impersonations of one person at a time like others. Uh, I did, but I became known for somebody who made all the different char- voices of the characters play ping-pong with each other, back on the forwards, back on the forwards, and I managed to impersonate the entire ITMAR programme, not just Tommy Handley, but all the voices talking backwards and forwards to each other, and then I topped this by saying goodnight. And so it's goodnight from Tommy Handley, Arthur Askew, blah, 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 all through the names, yeah. all saying cheerio, goodbye, ta-ta, Bob Gerrigle, in their voices. And this is the voice of them all, Peter Cameron, on the end of it. And I hadn't realised that I was making a complete revolutionary change to impersonating by doing this. A lot of people say, didn't you get in an awful muddle? Did you find yourself answering as Jack Train? Well, you should have been Tommy Handley and vice versa. Fortunately, I didn't. I used my brain, I suppose, as a reference library, but uh, the voice came as soon as I saw the person's face in my mind. Because I'm talking now about purely radio days. And uh, that, I suppose, was just the difference between my next will be and doing all these people backwards and forwards together. Tommy Handley, of course, was the great Liverpudlian comedian. We had Rob Wilton. You remember, Rob, with the, the day war broke out. I don't think it ever stopped breaking myself, but Rob was as Liverpudlian as you could, a real scouse. And then, of course, Tommy himself, you know. Hello, folks. It's the scouse boy himself. And, and he was a, a real Liverpudlian, but it was very different to impersonate Tommy Handley to other people. I'll tell you why. He was a Liverpudlian who had lived in London for so many years that he had lost his Liverpool accent, but not entirely. Whenever he got excited, the Lancashire accent took over. When he spoke slowly, the southern London accent took over. So his vowels were inconsistent. Are you with me? Sounds a bit double dutch. And so I had to practice saying phrases as Tommy Handy. Well, if it isn't fan, the memory man. You know, and so forth. Then you'd find him say, well, I don't know, slowly. And he'd say, well, I don't know. And he'd go, no, for northern, you see. And he'd say, well, I don't know, for southern. If it, so that whenever he was, it was a quick delivery, it was Liverpool. And when it was slow, it became London. Because he'd lived in the south of England for so many years. What a marvellous programme it was, only he says in Tommy's voice. What a marvellous programme. You remember, he, he was the mayor of Tom Topia. That's Not right. you, Topia, Tom Topia. Oh, an impressionist's dream, all those characters. Well, hello, folks. If it isn't Fantan, the memory man. Excuse please, mister. 
You buy saucy postcard? Saucy postcard? Oh, yes, pretty lady in the nude, very saucy, very rude. Good heavens, come in. Good morning, good morning, nice day. Ta-ta, cheerio. And then, of course, it was, uh, oh, well, time to do me knitting a knit. A gin and knit, sir. I do, I do, I do. Oh, Colonel, poor old Colonel. You're looking much as bourgeois. I am, Henley. <laughs> you know, he's ruined his own health drinking other people's. But it was a winner. I have a letter, a very treasured letter, from the late Thomas Reginald Handley. <laughs> Bless his heart. He wrote, and it's on Savage Club note paper, Dear Peter, listen to you last night. Many have tried, but all have failed. Congratulations. I think that's gorgeous. People say to me nowadays, Oh, you, you, last night you did uh, Dennis Healy or Professor... David Bellamy or uh, Enoch Powell or something like that. Uh, ooh, and I, I look at them rather nonplussed because to me there is not such a thing, or shouldn't be, as an impersonator who's become dated. Because after all, as the people come up and become famous, you should impersonate them. And as they sort of fade away from public uh, favouritism or whatever, well, you, you, you gently drop them or, you know. And uh, this it comes so strange to me. I, I think people sometimes come to see me in the theatre or in cabaret and they say, oh, and they expect me to do Montgomery and, uh, you know, Rob Wilton and all Hitler, as we might say, all those sort of people. But, of course, I don't. Um, I mean, you, you get people come up, some of them very slowly, and gradually become famous. And you say, well, I really must have a go at him, put him on. Or somebody comes all of a sudden. I mean, take somebody like uh, Dr. David Bill, you know, the botanist and the physicist and, and all other sorts of this, and sometimes a bit it and this. But you know what I mean? He, he has all these big, all little flowers growing up, seeing a field, and there the, between the cow patch, you get these lovely thistles coming up. Well, of course, <laughs> he came up from... Uh, uh, from uh, obscurity to fame in, in only a few months, the same as Dr. Magnus Pike and one, one or two others, and I think that you definitely uh, got to be on the ball. Um, the prime ministers have been impersonated, as we all know, but uh, uh, there are other ministers. Well, now, you all know me, your Chancellor, Mr. Healy, although I like to think that you, as I'm more such a kind and friendly type of chap, you think of me as your Uncle Dendens. <laughs> and, uh, you have <clears throat> these uh, characters like Enoch Powell, who are very explicit. And uh, the remarkable thing, if you speak about Enoch Powell, you can visualise the, the face with the high cheekbones and the little thin moustache and the projection of the speech as you go along. And there is no reason to think that seeing is necessarily believing. Uh, some people's voices characterise their features. It's a very extraordinary thing. And you, you get these people have definitely as much character as dear old Churchill. Yes, yes. Of course, at the uh, talking of Winnie, I have another treasured letter also, uh, one from Winston Churchill saying how very much he enjoyed uh, a recording I sent him, which I had made during the Royal Command performance of um, his voice, and I very greatly treasure that's another one of my treasured letters. That uh, particular first Royal Command performance that I did, I did Winston absolutely straight. Yes. Except that he made one little semi-humorous reference to the fact that the late Franklin D. Roosevelt uh, said about him, he said, <coughs> Your predecessor, Franklin Roosevelt, once said of me, Winston mobilised the English language and sent it to war. Peter Braff, Dickie Murdoch and myself were all at Windsor Castle. Yes. And um, the Queen Mother, she has now said to me, yeah, when you're at Windsor, you will do the impersonation of Monty, won't you? She because it will amuse my husband. So uh, came the day and I did the impersonation of Monty. And true enough, George VI did roar with laughter and threw his legs up in the air, you see. <laughs> and uh, so... Um, Peter Townsend, who was uh, the Queen Mum's equerry at the time this happened, uh, was standing next to me and I said, do you know, or can, have you any idea why His Majesty thought it was so funny? Apart just from the sort of sudden, you know, shock of the impression of Monty. And he said, well, not really, but uh, it just might be the fact that there's a story going around at the moment that I know the Royal Household have heard. 
And uh, he said, uh, Churchill used to have lunch every Thursday with the king during the war and for some little while after. And he used to chat about things. And Montaigne, who sort of got a bit out of the limelight, which didn't really please Montaigne at any time, uh, <laughs> and used to now and again make rather political speeches to get himself back in the papers. And he'd made one of these a little, perhaps, anti-conservative part, if you like to say. So King pointed to this on the Daily Paper and said to Churchill, what do you think about this fellow Monty? What do you say there, eh? That's it. And he said, Churchill looked at the headlines and pondered for a moment and read it. And he said, <clears throat> yes, General Montgomery, Field Marshal Montgomery, Lord Montgomery of El Alamein, I think he's after my job. And the king said, thank God, I thought he was after mine. Now, <laughs> whether that is what made them laugh or not, I don't know. But it's an rather sweet little story. We were talking, when we were in the car before we had this little chat on the air, about um, you asking me about how I came to impersonate Prince Philip. That's right. Um, the Water Rats, Grand Order of Water Rats, were doing a midnight matinee a charity show. Prince Philip is a companion water rat. And um, we were doing it on behalf of one of his favourite charities. And uh, so we had the Victoria Palace completely booked floor to ceiling for this charity. And Prince Philip and his equerry were in the box. And the late Jack Hilton was helping us run the show because it was his theatre. And uh, I got into the uh, Admiral of the Fleet's uniform and had the wig specially made with the peaked hair in front and so forth. And when I put it on, Absolutely seriously, I got a shock. I've never looked more like anybody in my life. I looked exactly like Prince Philip. And of course, I, I, when I got over the shock, I was over the moon about this. But the trouble came in getting his voice. And I had to go and watch um, a film of part of his TV geophysical year epic. Oh, yes, yes. And I was allowed off the cuff to go and listen to it. And suddenly I discovered that it was by placing the sound against his bottom teeth which gave him the particular sound. See, and he, <coughs> he has a, a voice which is very precise and he speaks in very deliberate short runs, very quick speed. And he emphasizes the point with due clarity, a quarter deck voice left over from the Navy. And uh, I got this particular voice, you see, and I thought, well, what do I do? And uh, so I, <laughs> I did a bit from the geophysical year, and um, I played the part absolutely straight. And after the show, I said, hope I didn't let the Navy down, sir, because I was all in the Admiral of the Fleet's uniform, of which Prince Philip's rather proud. And he said, oh, no, 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 fine. And that's how it started. And uh, then uh, I was asked three or four years ago by a very, very large concern, uh, of whom he is patron, uh, to appear as an absolute surprise, uh, a kidology, you see, yes. in Birmingham, in the big central place there, which most Brummies know. Um, and uh, it was international. There were people from branches of this association from the continent and everything else. And they, they booked me just to have a blackout in the, in the huge conference hall and then a pin spot. And I just appeared through the back of the curtains and uh, the Toastmaster said that... Um, I'd promised to appear if I could be guaranteed to get away from building in five minutes because I was on the way to the present the Duke of Edinburgh's awards to Sea Scouts, you see, yes. in my, use, my excuse of being in uniform. And the, the spotlight came on me, and uh, I stood there, as I'd seen myself first in the mirror, looking frightfully like him, and I had a three-and-a-half-minute, I know, because my friend timed it, standing ovation before I got my mouth open. And they really thought it was... They really thought it was... And then gradually, because I was doing little funnies isn't it, they, they twigged that there was something funny. But I, uh, p from halfway back onwards, I think that thousands of people still today think it was Prince Philip. <laughs> Quite extraordinary. Yeah, I see you're looking at my tape recorder, which is lying on the uh, couch beside me. It's all right, I'm not taping your voice. Uh, just a sound I want you to listen to. This particular sound in the late 50s and the very early 60s, in which I had some part excited me. <laughs> Motor racing. A friend of mine had some large charter aircraft 
which used to take out Sterling, Moss and Graham, Hill and Jack Brabham and Tony Brooks and all the boys to the Monte Carlo Grand Prix. And he came to me one day in the steering wheel club and he said to me, Pete, he said, have you ever thought of doing a cabaret on an aeroplane? <laughs> I said, good grief, that's something, isn't it? No, no, he said, I'm serious, serious, serious. He said, look, believe it or not, these boys that think nothing of 200 miles an hour and uh, a four-wheel power drift past the gas works like grease lightning, some of them are a bit squeamish with regard to flying. So he said, I thought, if you walked up and down with Tommy Cooper's hat on, putting floating sugar in their coffee and other daft pranks, you know, it'd take them out and we'd have a bit of fun and impersonate John Bolster doing his radio commentary. Um, here we are, chaps, coming into the pits now, and Moss is in a terrific hurry to change a spare wheel. Bolster was sitting at the back of the thing and having his stick. He said, would you do it? And you can have, you know, the four days in a hotel on the firm, on me, blah, blah, come as part of the entourage. Oh, my. And knowing most of the boys, you know, I did. And um, it, it, it was simply enormous fun. And... Uh, I kept the nonsense up whenever I felt there was nervous tension. Now, there is no greater nervous tension than a lot of boys on the starting line waiting for about five minutes when they know things are going to start to happen. And so I walked across the line dressed as in the full uniform as Monty, Montgomery, on the starting line. And Graham Hill and Jack Brabham and uh, Tony Brooks and a few more just fell about you know, in the cockpits. All the tense nerves are gone. Look at this! Look at him! Look at it! And it was right opposite the grandstand. And the gendarmerie, uh, you know, the policemen, they, they didn't know whether to arrest me or salute me. <laughs> See, by the time they'd made their mind up, I jumped over the pit counter and vanished and put on John Bolsa's hat and moustache and didn't know what they were talking about, old boy. <laughs> so, talking about good times with people did remind me Harry Worth. Harry was an established variety act for many years before he became known. Yes, yes. He used to say, he used to say to me and uh, Tony Fane of Fane and Evans when they were impersonating, he used to say, <laughs> I know you all want me to get famous because I'm so easy to do. <laughs> and he, my name is Harry Worth. Yeah, <laughs> my name is, you know how that started? My name is Harry Worth. He was a completely unknown act. And we used to do Bill's Galore and Harry was little name at the bottom of the bill. And he used to come out to the audience, especially somewhere like Liverpool Empire, packed with about three or four thousand people on a Saturday night. And he'd say, my name is Harry Worth. If you look on your programmes, you'll see it. Now, I feel I should explain something. I've never been on your radio. You haven't heard me. I haven't been on the television. I haven't even made a gramophone record. And after you've heard my act, <laughs> you'll realise why. <laughs> oh, he was a fabulous character. He started as a ventriloquist. Yes, did he did. Did you work with him as a vent? Yeah, he had a two most terrible dolls. He still has them, Peter. I know he does, and he's still cooking. And he used to do it, his terrible, great and gutter act, you think. But we were watching an act do a vent act, not an awfully good ventriloquist one night, when Harry was famous top of the bill. And he said, I've been watching this fellow, and he said, with that animal dog thing coming out of that case. He said, and he will say, Who's your favourite film star? Getty Gregel. He said, why does he say Getty Gregel? He could so easily say Lana Turner, which I thought was beautiful. <laughs> because Harry admits that he was the worst vent, but he's hysterically funny as a vent He used to have this hideous little doll. It looked like Frankenstein having taken a shrinking pill, you know. <laughs> and he used to put it on his knee and he said, this is the dummy, this is me. I am the ventriloquist. That is the dummy. Now, in order that there is no confusion, I shall allow my lips to move a little. <laughs> Do the people that people like, except um, the person that everybody loved uh, to hate. <laughs> in the days gone by, dear old Gilbert Harding. I must tell you a little story about Gilbert Harding. You remember, of course, Mike, he was always on What's My Line, really, that's where he made his name. Yeah. Well, they always used to have a guest, Mr. Celebrity, and uh, the team would have a blindfold put on. That's right. And Eamon Andrews would say, all right, Mr. Celebrity, will you kindly come in and sign in, please? Gilbert, no peeping there, and have you all got your blackouts on properly? Well, <laughs> this format, you see, came to a guest that uh, they'd uh, 
rather had thoughts about if it could be wangled. Gilbert Harding to be the guest, you see, while the others are blindfolded, and Peter Kavanagh to impersonate Gilbert Harding. On the panel? Yes, on the panel. Yeah. But Ronnie Waldman, who was director of Light Entertainment, BBC Television at the time, said, how on earth are you going to do this? The producer said, look, easy. Get all their blindfolds on. Gilbert won't put his on. He'll have stocking feet, kick his shoes off under the table, get gently only on the corner of the table, just you know, a couple of feet into the guest chair, and Peter Kamler can come in from the back in stocking feet also, creep into his chair while I'm giving uh, Barbara Kelly, say, the first question, just so that it masks it, and Gilbert will be the guest. Won't work, said Ronnie. Well, have a bet with you, said J uh, Jacko, the producer. So they had a bet on this. Well, Gilbert kept up this disguised voice quite well. Oh, yes, I don't think so, sometimes. You see, and there was a lot of laughter from the studio. And they started to think, this is a bit odd. And then, of course, when it got to me, as Gilbert asking him, can you tell me, Mr. Sobity, do you think you're funny? And he'd say, well, sometimes. Yes. Well, I mean, you must know. Either you are or you are not. I mean, you must know. Are you telling us the truth? Yes, I am. Thank God for that, you see. And screams of laughter. And... Gradually, one by one, the team thought there's something odd here, there's something odd, but they couldn't put their finger on it, uh, and, and we got away with it. Because you assumed Gilbert's role. Yes. You were rude to him. Yes, I was rude to Gilbert. Yes. But Gilbert was one of the nicest men uh, that uh, I ever knew and had the happiness to uh, impersonate. The producer won his bet because Mr. C uh, thinks he can impersonate me, and he bloody well can. <laughs> Is that what he said? <laughs> Which uh, rather takes away the thing that everybody says, oh, I didn't recognise myself when I played my tape recorder. How do I know it's me? <laughs> you see? Well, as you might expect, before I left Peter, I asked him to finish our programme in his own inimitable way. From Harry Hemsley. Bring out, Daddy. Frankie Howard. Oh, I should say so. Dennis Healy. Don't forget. Enoch Powell. It's a revelation. Tommy Handy, ta folks. Prince Philip, thank you very much indeed. David Bellamy, oh, it's very interesting, very interesting. Monty, stand at ease there. Gilbert Harding, it serves you right. And from the voice of them all, Peter Kavner and myself, Mike Craig, thank you for listening. Bye bye. And you can hear the last in this repeat series of It's a Funny Business tomorrow night when Mike Craig remembers Jack Warner. After news, Patrick Lunt will be with you for Night Ride. BBC Radio 2